Welcome, everybody. Welcome to another live stream. Happy Saturday. Hope you're having a fantastic weekend. We're going to get things kicked off. I'm enjoying playing with my uh, toy here. That's why we got intro music this morning. So if you have not seen a live stream with a call-in show before, 361-733-3332 is the number. And uh, we're going to be taking callers today. This might actually be one of, if not the last live stream call-in show we have before the spring rush. So if you have your hard-hitting questions that you must get answered before the spring rush, make sure you call in today and uh, get those answered. I have a couple uh, questions that have been coming in on the chat. So I'll jump in on those. But if anyone wants to ask a question, call the number below and you will get priority. All right. Let's see here. Tar Heel Ariels says, I've been watching you for three years. How or probably three years or however long you've been on YouTube. I'm still kind of confused on what systems are. What would be a system if I owned a lawn care business and how would I implement it in my business? I used to have the name William I on here. Okay. All right. So in terms of systems, uh, I look at systems, creating systems uh, as two, the, st the simplest two steps to that are simplification and standardization. So simplification would be taking out the unnecessary, taking out the waste, taking out the things that are uh, encumbering you from being able to do to make things repeatable. And standardization is how do we do the same thing the same way every single time? So uh, whether you have massive projects, you can still standardize. You might not be able to simplify, but you can standardize. And so those would be the two things that I'd be asking yourself. If you want to create a system for sales, how do you standardize and simplify the process to where you could train it very easily, very quickly, very efficiently, and they're, they're, uh, all the aspects of variability are removed, whether that be types of services, simplification. Okay, we're going to take our 15 services and simplify them down to five. Or is it standardization? We're going to take these five services and we're going to have the same exact process that we follow every single time. We're going to use the same type of block, the same color of block if you're installing walls. Uh, these are the type of things that you can do to create systems in your business and then create systems for every single aspect of the business is standardize and simplify. Now, that might mean you're actually willing to give up some efficiency in order to standardize or in order to simplify. You might be willing to leave some money on the table and leave some revenue on the table in order to be able to cut out certain services that are distracting you from your core competency. It, I guarantee you, if you just took your 20 services that you currently offer, and trust me, if you're in the green industry, you're literally probably offering 20 services, bush trimming, weeding, fertilization, mowing, mulch installation, all these are different services. If you took the 20 that you offer and focused on your five core competencies, not only would you be more profitable, your marketing would do better because you'd be more focused on what actually the services you actually are profitable and efficient at. And it'd be easier to find employees because they would could be lower skill level because you'd only need to train them on five things and you'd get them up to profitability much sooner than if you were to have to train them on every single service and they need to know everything to be efficient and profitable. So when you're talking about, to, talking about systems, the number one thing I'd be asking is, and the first steps I'd be looking at is simplification, and standardization. Those are that. All right, let's see if we got some other questions. There's a whole bunch of coming in, mercy. Um, ba -ba -ba. Okay, we got tons of questions. Okay, all right, I gotta get started here at the top. If you had a limited budget, for marketing in the spring, which methods would you choose? Second year under 250K. I'd make sure I have a website in place and then I'd be make, making sure that I have two things. One, if I'm going after specific neighborhoods, every door direct mail and yard signs, it's very, very cheap to be able to target very specific neighborhoods. If you're trying to cast a wider net, probably Google and you'd be using uh, Google ads to be able to you know, advertise that people have intent to buy and, and are searching for a specific, specific service. All right, if you have a question and you would like to get priority above all these other people asking questions, call this number right here, 361-733-3332. This is potentially the last, if not one of the last, live streams and calls that we'll be able to do before Spring Rush because I'm going to, potentially the next four to eight weeks will be the busiest weeks of my life. So we are not gonna be able to have time for any sort of live streams. All right, next question. When you give profit share, are you going off operating profit or net profit before or after amortization and depreciation? I am going off of cash basis. All right. So if I am buying a truck for $20,000, 
That $20,000 is coming off on the PL, and that's what I'm using for profit sharing. If you start putting in things like the, uh, 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 amortization and depreciation, your, your guys are not going to understand it. And they're going to think that you're cheating the system and you're trying to cheat them out of their profit sharing. So in my personal recommendation, in my personal experience, what I've seen work well for your frontline team members to be able to understand and comprehend what's going on, you're going to want to ensure that you have, um, you have cash basis. Yes, you could use uh, accrual. That's what you're going to be using for your accounting likely and your taxes, et cetera. However, your crew is not going to understand when you start depreciating your truck over the course of five years or when you accelerate the depreciation versus not. These are the type of things that it's like use the cash basis so they understand money in, money out. And at the end of the day, they're getting a piece of all the extra money that's left in the bank account. That's the simplest way to explain it. All right, let me make sure that I have my phone line set up correctly. Okay, good, I do. All right, just making sure because no one's calling in and that's how it always works. No one calls in the beginning and then we're flooded with calls. And I have to cut everyone off. So if you have a question, make sure you call in. All right. Mike, is spring rush will be different this year with massive layoffs in tech industry? Thanks. So in my opinion, there's going to be a shift towards the more professional uh, operators. Here's why. Number one, you have a de uh, decreasing amount of consumer demand. Less people need our services. So in theory, we should all get less calls. We should all get less uh, people needing our services, et cetera, because we're going into recession. There's going to be layoffs, things like that. However, at the same time that that is happening, it's going to be more important than ever to get customers that people have a great marketing strategy. They know how to have good branding, a good website, have the ability to be able to make an offer on their uh, marketing and their advertising. Uh, get creative with the type of door hangers they're, they're putting up. Get creative with the type of emails that they're sending out. And so the people that do that, I think will actually capitalize and, and become even stronger because the smaller operators will get wiped out. The people that have a price competitive, always chopping price, they're in a race to the bottom. They'll continue that race even in a faster clip because now the consumer will be even more price sensitive. But for the, the operator that is that has been going after that customer, that that expects brand, expects professionalism, expects a higher type of service, then they're going to be insulated. That customer will be insulated from a recession. And so I think there's going to be even more of a segmentation of, you know, chucking the trucks and the, and the operators that I don't use, I don't use that terms disparagingly. I mean, the operators that are uh, racing to the bottom in terms of price, they're unprofessional. They don't have a website. They're doing things under the table. They're going to keep going down uh, because they're, target market, the person that's going after bargain basement pricing is going to get hurt very much so. Whereas the customer that is a uh, real estate, owns a bunch of real estate, has multiple businesses, extremely wealthy, retired, they're going to continue to need our services. They're going to continue to buy and they're going to go after the operator that is more professional, is insured, and is uh, making sure that their, their team is, is adequately paid to be able to be professional and to be trained up correctly. Just my opinion. Where do you recommend hiring people from? Our base is $4 over our markets hourly. So pay is high. Just need applicants. Yeah. So, you know, obviously Indeed right now is crushing it. Uh, Facebook jobs, by the way, is going away. So if you've been advertising on Facebook, uh, that's going to be going bye-bye. I don't think they give us a specific date yet, but is going to be going goodbye. And Indeed is going to be the place, I think, for most people. There's definitely a ZipRecruiter. There's a couple of other, obviously, Craigslist is not a bad option. In some markets, it crushes, honestly. Uh, but I'd say Craigslist and Indeed is going to be the ones that kind of run away with this. And Indeed is the one running away with it from a corporate standpoint. So um, they're going to do really well. They've really refined their uh, hiring, pro the whole process of app applying as well as just getting uh, the whole interview process now they've, they've conquered and things like that. So I think they're crushing it. Uh, I would definitely say if you're $4 more per hour, try to incentivize things with other things than uh, with things other than dollars and cents in terms of benefits, like paid time off, maybe do a gym re reimbursement program. Like, so if they pay their membership for their gym, you pay them back. Uh, potentially doing P for P, pay for performance. So it's not just $4 more per hour they can make than the average going rate in your market. They might be able to make eight or $10 more per hour. If they're a go-getter and they're a hustler, you're going to attract all the best people doing that. So again, I'm a massive proponent of P for P. All right, next question or next call is going to come from area code 216. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Appreciate it. Hello. Hey, how's it going? Hey, it's going good. It's going good. Uh, so yeah, I had a couple questions. I'm calling people about um, 
like calling everybody in my contacts about landscaping this year. Um, and I mean, I have objections, and I just want to see how you get past that. What's the objections you're or hearing? You just move on. Uh, that they have somebody um, that they're worried about the price, or that they usually do it themselves. Okay, and so those are the three. Those are the most three most common. What do you say to the first one? Uh, to uh, oh, that they have somebody. Uh, the first, yeah. Let's um, just start I with that one. That's that, okay. Yeah, I say that. Uh, <laughs> it's always good for a change. Um, that you know, I ask him if there's anything wrong with their service or you know how their service is, and um, I mean, I basically just try to be honest about my business and. And so, and so, are these cold calls? Are you knocking on their doors? What? How? What's the format of this outreach? Um. Yeah, it's cold calling everybody in my contacts that I've had. You know, as a potential prospect, I just save their number and give them a call. See if they'd be interested in you know landscaping or snow plowing. Are you saving them in your phone? Yeah. Okay, and how many how many contacts do you think you have? Uh, Five hundred. Yeah, so like I would I would highly recommend using email and text messages through a CRM to be able to reach these people because doing. No, five, yeah, go yeah, ahead. For sure, I understand. Yep. Uh, I, I don't have many their email addresses, so don't really. So you're calling them. Okay. Yeah. Like I think that's definitely fine. You're reaching yeah. out. It's going to take you a while, but you know, if you have time on your hands, you could probably knock out 500 calls in, in a week. So like, um, I would say if, if you, if they're coming back with a bunch of objections or like they're having someone else, et cetera, you're, you're probably going to have 80, 90% of people not be serviceable out of the 500 anyways. So I wouldn't necessarily, especially mm-hmm. if you're calling them all, try to fight that battle. Uh, if people are saying no, right. Cause like, out of out of that 500, guarantee you that 450 are either doing their own service, they don't need the service, uh, they have someone else doing, it, et cetera. So I think just getting in their ear is important, keeping them warm. This is why I'm I'm a big fan of the email right. side of things because you can keep them warm with like a monthly email without having to call them all and make a full time job for yourself of calling them. Keep them warm, right? Because like right. you can you can yes, absolutely try to go over the objections or prove why you're better than the other service they currently have. But what's better is stay keep them warm so that when they that service service does let them down or that service goes out of business in a recession that they then do call you because you've stayed in contact with them. And so I would probably honestly do my very best to get everyone's email uh, going forward. And then, you know, even if you're reaching out to these customers, trying to get their, their email would be, would be beneficial. Um, and if the, even if you make that part of your estimate process, you, like, you must have an email on file because that's how you're uh-huh. in the future going to be able to reach out to them in a less aggressive way and not take so much of your time, but just keep them warm. Cause it might be two years of you sending them monthly emails before finally they actually need your services. So stop trying to sell the unsold. Like, like they're, if they're unsellable, there's no reason to spend your time, you know, just trying to just leave it alone, keep them warm, stay professional. And then down the road, if they need your services because their current provider drops out or they you know, have an injury and they can't do it themselves anymore, or uh, they have a second house right. and they need, need someone, then they'll think of you because you've, you've kept them in your Rolodex. Okay. Yeah. You, you've dealt with people that are like, Hey, yeah, we spoke in and then my landscape, you know, stop coming. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, so be the person um, that they think of when that happens. Okay. Okay. All right. And I just have one more question. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to see about regrading. Like if the, uh, if the yard has like a slope, um, I have to put some dirt in. Uh, have you ever done any, anything like that? Yeah, we used to do a bunch of them back in the day. Um, what's your total annual revenue right now? Um, like 50,000, 60,000. Mm-hmm. And do you want to take this in the direction of more lawn care and recurring based business, or are you trying to do more project services? Um, I say definitely for this year, uh, lawn care, repetitive service. Um, yeah. And then just try to try to get more lawn care with those people, you know, get projects out of them. And, yeah, like I think I, I think going into the regrading game is, is a completely different industry, in my opinion, compared to mowing. 
right? And so you're going to be talking about excavation. Right. You're going to be talking about knowing grades. You're going to need to know about laser levels. You're going to be working with other contractors, typically if they are doing a big hardscaping project or a pool, um, or if they're just trying to regrade their lawn, like you're tearing out a lot of the lawn. You're having to haul away debris. Hey, I, I don't mean to, um, I don't mean to cut you up. I I wanted to see like. Should I be accepting these jobs from customers or it, it depends? Like I wouldn't recommend it. Customers are like, oh, I wouldn't yeah, recommend it. I mean, if, you're doing, if you're doing 50,000 in, in annual revenue, you know, one regrading job is going to be five, 10 grand. You're talking about 10% of last year's revenue in one project. Like those are the type of projects I see people lose their shirt on. And it's easy to get involved in that because like, man, a couple of those jobs, I could literally double my revenue. Yes, you could, but you're also going to need more equipment, right. more experience, bigger trucks to be able to haul this debris away. So it's just, it's, it's a completely different ball game. I just be careful with trying to sprint before you've really started a jog. Right, you've got started, like you got fifty thousand, that's definitely something. But like, you know, do 150, do two hundred, then maybe you start to focus on these regradings when you have the capital and the experience uh, and you've been jogging before you start trying to sprint, which is really what that kind of project is. Like regrading is no monkey business. Like you really gotta know what you're doing when it comes to bases, the grit of uh, the, your compact base level and stuff like that. And, you know, really figuring out grades. So, um, it's definitely a very, uh, much more complicated than mowing. So figure the mowing side out, figure the business side out, hiring, et cetera, and then jump into something like that. I would say in a couple of years. Okay, for sure. And I want to say to everybody on the live stream, you know, we're dedicated, uh, we're, we're looking to, to grow. So salute to everybody. on here. Awesome. All right there. Thank you. Yeah. Take care. All right. Bye. Next call is coming from 563. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Hey, Mike. Hey, thanks for having me. I got a question on advertising for mowing and treatment. So okay. basically, I want to promote a sense of scarcity in my advertisement. And when I, when I do this, when I send out a print mailing piece, I want to give, you know, give that sense of scarcity, but I don't want to do it in a, a phony or, or full of crap kind of way. Because it is kind of a you know, it's a commoditized product in, in many ways. And um, I'm just wondering what the best way to go about that is, what maybe what verbiage to use or, or how you would do that. What service are you trying to pitch? Uh, mowing and treatment. Okay. And when are you going to be doing this marketing campaign? Do you know? Yeah, the first one will be uh, March 10th. And is every door direct mail or door hangers? Every door direct mail. Cool. So, um, what you want to do is two things. One, the main scarcity you have is time, and the second one is capacity, right? So the first one you can use is, hey, at this specific time, we start you know, booking out or we stop taking customers, right? So you can say, uh, for example, selling spring cleanups, a great way to do that is say, hey, our mowing season starts March 1st. We, you must get your spring cleanup done before February or done before March, or otherwise you're going to be three month, we're going to be three months booked out because we get really busy. So that's going to be your timeline when it's like, hey, like there's a certain cutoff time. The second is your capacity. And that, that, the biggest one that we can use in this industry is we have X amount of spots available on our schedule. Now, if that's not true, I'm not a huge fan of using that. However, if you actually know your capacity, like we talked about at conference and like you actually understand like, okay, I can actually realistically get 120 customers. I'm currently at 90 right now. I have 30 spots available. And you actually then you can use that in your marketing. Like, hey, we have 30 spots available. Uh, they go quickly. We're going into the spring rush, get on the schedule now. So that sort of scarcity definitely helps as well. Um, so I, I would say the capacity, like how many jobs you can take. And secondly, the timing of when you take certain projects or services. Cause like, for example, we don't take big projects during spring rush. So like if someone wants their product done, we push them hard in January and February to get it out of the way, uh, to try to like, just know that, Hey, during spring rush, you can't get it done. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I got one quick follow-up question mm -hmm. on that too. So with my uh, my one-click estimate at the end of the month, would you recommend uh, sending that out and then several days later sending out another email saying that we've we've uh, we've sold out essentially, just letting all the customers know to kind of get them ready for the next time we do a, a uh, one-click estimate? The only reason I wouldn't say to send the the that you're sold out is that you are going to have attrition and you'll need to fill those spots, right? So you might get the 120, but every week you're going to lose one or two because people move there, they pass away, they are unhappy with service, and you're going to need a little bit of a stream of people to still come in and fill their spots. And it'll be ingenuous. And then at that point, if you're accepting them, they won't understand. So um, I would not necessarily send that email out, especially three days later, because you 
doing an email three days later, you're going to start, people are going to start unsubscribing from your email list. And so I would just focus on use the scarcity, get those in that initial rush in. And then if people ever ask you about it, you can, you should be able to be honest with them and be like, Hey, we lose customers uh, periodically because they move, they, 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 they sell their house, et cetera. And you do, we still do have a couple more spots available. Okay. Okay. That makes perfect sense. Thanks, thanks a lot, Mike. I really appreciate it. You got it. All right. Next caller is coming from 972. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Hi. Thanks for taking the time to do this. Um, I've got an interesting question that I don't think I've heard you talk about on the front end, only on the back end, is uh, charging for estimates to come out and give an estimate to help get rid of tire kicks. Yeah, absolutely. I know you talked in the past about charging on the back end to raise your prices, to have a profit margin, but what about on the front end? Because I do mowing in small and large projects, and I've got a lot of tire kickers mm-hmm. uh, or people that just aren't that ready to go about it. So I'm just trying to find a way to weed them out because even if I ask qualifying questions up front, people will say, oh, I've got a budget or this. i got some things that are ready, but mm-hmm. they really don't. Totally. So two questions. Number one, um, are you trying to grow the business very quickly right now or is it more focused on profitability? Um, I'm kind of in the middle. So last year we grew a lot. We went from 600K to about 1.2. And hey, this year, um, that's gross. concerns with not knowing how the, yeah, it is. But this year, I don't want to, I don't think I want to get any more. I want to focus more on the profitability side. If I could grow also, I would. But big shout out to you guys for website. Last year, we were doing maybe three or four estimates a week where I'm doing three to four a day today because our website's ranking so much better because of long-term media. And so, um, just turning into February. I'm doing way, way more. I can only expect the spring is going to be more, so I'm not going to be able to handle everybody. And I'm the only estimator. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, to, so first and foremost, and I can't you. and I can't expand crews. Right. I don't have the people for that. Okay, so that's important. So that's the capacity question. Okay. Okay. So here we go. So um, first and foremost, thank you for the shout out for Long Career Web Design. Appreciate that. Um, the, note that that's going to get even more leads this year. So our, your second spring rush, we've seen across the board, a doubling of leads on all our websites. So that's going to increase substantially if this is your second year of the website. Is this your second spring rush of the website? Yes. So last year, I believe we started in January. Yeah. Uh, so we went through fold last year. Oh, no, no, it was in uh, August. So they, it was like August is when we got the website started. And I think like November or so is when it went up. And then, you know, Yep. So that, that was your first it, one. This it, is your second one. So your sec, yeah. So your second spring rush is yeah. going to be significantly more. So I, I, this, in this case, that's when you might want to actually charge on the upfront, right? So a charge for the estimate. Mm-hmm. And then you could do this one of two ways. A, you just charge across the board for a quote to come out to their property or two, you simply say, um, you know, you charge a higher amount, but then it goes towards the quote if they accept right? Um, I'm actually in the camp, if you're going to do this, to do it on the upfront, like, hey, we just charge to come to your property, right? Um, and it's, it's a service that we provide. We do a, a, an inspection and we look at all, everything you need. You're going to eliminate a lot of the tire kickers, like you said, and you're probably only going to get customers that have already known your service is reputable and they've been referred to you. They have word of mouth, their friends and their family, they've used you. Those are the customers you're going to get because they're, they're, they're the only ones that will pay for you to come out. Right. Um, and what you could do, so we, go ahead. One thing about that, we don't, we, so we do have a lot of reviews. We've got about 30 something five star reviews, but mm-hmm. we don't really get any uh, uh, people that refer us. But, but this is the thing when, Most, uh, when everyone that we get is new. Right. But um, when I say referrals, I'm also talking about people just knowing your brand, like seeing your trucks, they search on Google and they see you in native search. Those I would almost, I'd just consider that like, referrals like people that have come to your site right um they found you without you paying for them that's what i should say you aren't paying for these leads like last year for example what did you spend on marketing do you think probably about 70k yeah so that's what i would be chopping out right if you chop that 70k out honestly your leads even though you're in your second spring rush will be massively diminished and then you'd be able to um, the leads that do come in are going to be much more qualified. They're going to be your referrals. The people find you on native search. And that 70K is going to be like, literally can go in your pocket now. 
Um, and then it'll bring your leads down just organically in that manner. But in terms of my, my general thought process is to not charge on the leads. Here's why. Because I'd rather get them in the door, prove my service, and then be able to raise prices on them. Whereas if I would have just from the very front say, hey, you're, I'm going to charge you $80 to come to your property and just say hello, um, I might not get them. Whereas if I get them in the door and they accept, I might be able to raise their prices three times over the next 10 years and make them an extremely high lifetime value customer in that time period. The only reason you would ever... And that's kind of the conundrum I'm in. So this is what... I have... Go ahead. So I'm, I'm in a little different. So I feel like what our, the reason this is what's difficult is because I don't have the capacity. I don't have the people to get either another estimator or another crew leader and experienced crew guys that'll be able to expand this. And if I'm doing, I can do probably eight appointments a day. So if I'm already half that right now, spring rust, I'm going to have too many. And yeah. I'm not marketing right now. Yeah. It's all again. So what's the bigger capacity, the, the ability to do more things. estimates or the ability to get the work done? Oh. Okay. So I would raise your prices. I would raise your prices dramatically. Because what you're going no, to do, no, I don't. I, I have a very low, so it's I have a very low closing ratio. I'll, I close maybe one out of eight. I mean, I, I I'll do a full day of appointments if I'm booked out to close one. I know, you but, get but if out, you're at capacity, uh, I mean, we're, but if you're at capacity and you're worried about taking more clients on, like from the labor perspective, you're at capacity. Regardless, you should raise prices because even if you lost fifteen or twenty, I'm talking about existing customers, not new customers, existing customers. So this is more. Okay, so I might have missed something. So it's more the estimator side. I can't see the, this many people. Got it. If it doubles, let's say. Do you do any? My crew, I can your... add more people on the crew. I can make it work. Got it. Um, do you do any of your estimates over the phone? For like mowing stuff? Or are you just, this is mostly all just talking mom, about landscaping? All my mowing over the phone. Got it. Okay. Yeah, so you're talking about landscaping. I'll get pictures. You can clean up. Yeah, landscaping. Can you simplify these services that you're doing to be able to train a lower level skilled estimator? I've got a guy that can do it. He's got more experience than I do. He's just also the guy that has more experience doing the work. So yep. if I take him out of the field, the crew is going to be limited. So this is this is the conundrum and I'm that mostly to fix that this year. But yeah. I just don't have the guy, so I can't plan for it. Yep. This is exactly what happens with most companies when they get above a million, and that is that it's so difficult to find a salesperson that can be adequate enough to replace the owner. And if you're closing one out of eight at your level. The fact is there's probably everyone's going to be at one out of 15. Like there's, you're that good. Right. And you have all the years of experience, you know how to sell, yeah. you are the owner. There's probably no one going to be as good as you. So in this case, what you have to do is create systems around the sales process. If you're ever going to get out of daily operations, if you're ever not going to be the salesperson, you've got to have systems. And like we talked about earlier in the call is like, that means simplification and standardization. And that might mean looking at your uh, all of your services and be like, Hey, we're going to cut five services. Like this is what we did over the course of four years to get me out of daily operations for my existing, from my very first location. We used to do artificial turf grading excavation. We had massive dump trucks. Um, and every year we just took away one or two services until last year we took away anything with blocks. Like we don't do any walls or retaining walls. And we used to do tons of them and we just, every year is chipped away. At it. And the reason you can't do it in one fail swoop is because you'd cut your revenue in half. And that, usually won't work because your, uh, your overhead structure won't support that. Um, and you'd be unprofitable. But if every year you just slowly chip away at the services that are most complicated, uh, and, and then what happens in the two or three years, you'd be literally be able to get someone that's worked with you for six or eight months and pull them in the estimator position, assuming that they have a decent personality because they've reduced the amount of services. And then the, the simple services, and I say, air quotes on that because you can have very complicated services but standardize them it's easier to sell those when you only have five or six services versus 20 or 25 mm -hmm. right okay so and then i, I actually don't think i know a little more about the situation I, charge for this charge or for the estimates booked out a week waiting to see me yeah or have people booked out a week to wait and see if they can meet with me i i would personally not now but in a month yeah I would personally take a look at, you know, obviously you're trying to qualify them and everything from the office perspective before you even get to the estimate. However, I would personally make sure that the services that you are willing to offer are even on that estimate, right? Because if immediately you cut out half of your services, you just reduced how many estimates you're getting by half and they're never even going to make it on your schedule. So you just solve the problem there. And then if you're also having problems with capacity on the labor side, you raise prices 
lose 10, 15% of your customers. Now you're more profitable. You spend that money now on training another estimator, take your spot. And now they can do it because you simplified services and then standard. Then this next third part is standardization of the estimate process, how the notes go, you know, have a template where you copy and paste those. So they only need to adjust a few things. So I would be focused on that. And this is why most operators get above a million and then realize like they're tied to their business. And they're the ones almost always doing all the sales and the estimating is because they have so many different services. They can never hand it off to anyone else with any level of experience. And if they do find that person, they're paying out to Wazoo for them. Okay. And then uh, one follow-up question that's a little bit different. Uh, I haven't heard specifically, do you guys charge your hourly rate to include your load up and unloading or is it just when you're on the job site? We just charge when we're on the job site, but our budgeted hours uh, we ac- we accommodate the fact that they're going to be unloading and loading, but we never tell the customer our hourly rate. So um, we, they just see a dollar amount, they accept that. But in terms of like how we how we schedule and you know uh, schedule the guys on P P, we assume that there's drive time, unload time, etc. Mm-hmm. So like for projects, if I think it's going to be one day and it's a nine hour day to start to finish, I charge for nine hours times eighty an hour. Yep. So is that what you do, even though we're only on job eight? Okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. Sounds All good. Right. I appreciate it. Good Thanks. stuff, brother. Best of luck. All right. Next caller is coming from 509. Welcome to the show. Sorry for the delay. Hey, Mike. Thanks for taking my call. Um, so my question is, uh, right now, I have about $70,000 worth of work lined up for the spring time, but I have no employees. All my employees, they have, they have left, uh, moved away. So I could keep hiring and training, but I'm in the field all all season hiring and training people. So my question is, should I sell my landscape company and start a brand new mowing company? Or should I subcontract my work and then start to train for mowing? What do you want to do? Like a mowing division. Um, I want to build up a company. So I think that, you know, mowing would be, would be the best route for that. Okay. Um, why can't you, can't you train someone up right now before that work needs to be performed in March or April? I could, I just feel like, um, it's like consecutive every year. I'll train somebody up all season. And then like at the end of the season, they stick around for maybe like a season or two. And then I'm always retraining for, cause we do hardscape patios, retaining walls, water yep. features. So. It takes a lot of my time to be in the field and train people on that. And then once I get them to that level where they can kind of, you know, start to work on their, by their self, they end up, you know, usually moving away or something. So, yeah, so one of two I'm things, either, I a, either a, you raise your price to the point where you can pay them substantially more so they don't leave. Like I'm talking five to $10 more mm-hmm. if they're a skilled hardscaper. Um, and, or secondly, yep. you simplify the services you're willing to offer. So you don't require that high level of skill and you'll, you're okay with them only staying with you one season because you can train someone else up in their place after just, you know, a week or two worth of work. If it's taking someone three months to get them coolly trained up in this labor market, it's going to be extremely difficult to ever be able to make them profitable because there's constantly, you're just going to be churning and burning through employees. That's what I'm, that's where I'm at right now. Yeah. So, so what I would personally so, do is, yeah. you know, it, it, because these, because these contracts, you really could care less if you keep them. Um, at this point, you're considering subbing them. I would potentially go find that hire, offer them more money, and then go to these contracts and be like, hey, I've got to charge X amount more uh, because of cost of materials, cost of labor, everything's gone up. And if you lose some of them, who cares? Maybe only fifty thousand of that actually comes through. But now it's going to be done at a much higher profit level, and you'll be able to handle it with the person that you are now training and know that you're able to pay them five, $10 more per hour because of the increased, uh, you know, the increased cost you've passed along to the customer. Okay. So if I want to add a lawn care division to my company, um, I would be training them in the hardscape and then I'd have to also, I believe, hire somebody else to start training them in mowing. Not necessarily because like with so mowing, be- mowing, if you have a decent training system in place within a week or two, you should be able to be up and running and very profitable with someone who's, who's very green. And so um, okay. there would be no problem with having project-based work. And then they also figure out mowing. If someone can figure out building a retaining wall, they can figure out how to mow grass. 
And so the, the training perspective isn't going to be the problem. The thing is, when you have a skilled laborer that can also do retaining walls and pave your patios, the fact is they're typically worth more than what you can pay and afford to pay doing simple services on lawn care. So that's why you got to be careful with doing cross training at a small size company like you're at uh, to where, um, you know, guys are cross trained because if you like someone can do paver patios, they can literally make $30, $35 an hour. Well, you can't afford to pay Correct. that on mowing. So just be careful with that aspect. And that's Correct. when the second part might come into play. And that is you simplify the services that you're performing in order to be able to, um, accommodate a, 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 a shorter training cycle. And you're okay with a little bit of churn and burn. Gotcha. Yeah. Cause that was my problem last last couple of years is that if I paid somebody 30 to do a patio, I couldn't have them go mow lawn for that rate. So it was kind of, so maybe I should just plan on hiring two people. Cause right now I have no employees. So maybe two people, one for mowing and then uh, one for the hardscapes and kind of train them both. Is that what you'd recommend? As long as you think you can get enough leads and enough work coming in, then yes. Okay. Because if because the problem is like you're literally right, considering doubling your capacity in terms of labor, so just make sure you have enough leads, enough work to be able to keep both of them busy. Perfect. Thank cool. you. Oh, you got it. All right, folks. We have a hundred people on the live stream. Exactly one hundred. Don't leave. All right. I'm going to go get my laptop charger because this thing is dying. If as long as when I come back, there's still a hundred or more people on the live stream, then we will continue. So. Hold the phone. Hold the phone. People in the waiting list. I know there's a whole people waiting. Just give me a second. All right. We're coming. It's working. Okay. Here we go. Oh, we did it. Let's go. <laughs> Oh man, exactly 100 down to the exact. I love it. All right, let's keep rolling. Next caller is coming from 229. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Hey, Mike, how are you? So my question uh, for you is, we changed up our billing and basically our entire recurring system for our mowing route. So what we had before was a bill per service but the issue with that was, say, we're charging for a weekly service and the customer may put it off for a month during the winter. But in our market, we still have leaves falling and things like that. So it almost takes it takes the exact same amount of time during the winter um, in order to be able to do that service. So what we have changed is we changed over to a subscription-based mowing. And so we only take weekly. We only have card on files. That kind of allowed us to do all of those things that we were wanting to do separately all in that one package. So. Everyone is subscription based. It may be a hundred, two hundred, three hundred dollars a month per person. Um, and then we charge however much their monthly rate is. We bill that monthly. We charge that monthly rate to get started. So we have a twenty-five dollar customer acquisition cost. And then if we acquire them for twenty-five dollars, say, we have a minimum of a hundred dollars monthly cost that we recoup. So basically every customer that signs up, we get four times the return without doing anything just for signing them up. But my question for you is, should we cut out projects if we haven't found a way to make those profitable yet? And should we sub those out? Should we recommend other companies? Should we continue doing those and just figure out a way to make those profitable and hire more teams um, or open and like separate the two divisions? I don't know. What was your total annual revenue last year? Uh, 250. Okay, and why do you want to add projects? So we're currently doing projects. So okay. we're looking to possibly cut projects. Um, and so what we have right now is two to three days of recurring mowing, and then we have maybe three days of projects for okay. our team. But what we're looking to do is possibly cut those projects, dump the money into marketing, and then we can recoup that amount quickly and hire more team and purchase more trucks and things to account for that because we're trying to go to 2 million this year. So you're trying to go to 2 million this year. I don't know what. Yes, sir. I would not recommend that. <laughs> why, why are you going from 200,000 to 2 million? What's going to, like how much we're trying to go to 10. Go ahead. Do what? 
we're trying to grow to 10 million um, by the time I turn 20. So currently I'm 16, we're aiming for 2 million. Um, and so I wanted to try to grow this location um, to the point where it's large enough and we can just swap into profitability, profitability mode this year. Mm-hmm. And then after this year, um, we can begin opening up other locations and we can kind of learn the systems on this one to know what works and just kind of plug and play. So you're saying we, is it just you as the owner right now? Uh, we have two, two people right now that are full time. Okay. And it, I mean, like in terms of ownership, are you at the top and like, there's no other owners or is someone else involved? Yes, sir. That's correct. Okay. Yes, sir. It's just me. So let me, I, I look, I do not want to be uh, negative and I, I appreciate the hustle, but this is my problem is going from 200,000 to a $2 million business is probably going to require at least two to $300,000 worth of acquisition of just your trucks and equipment. Like, do you have that kind of capital? Okay. We don't. Right. So the reason I'm saying this is because I, what I don't want you to do is set yourself up for, I'm going to make $2 million this year. And then it comes out to 400,000 and you feel like a failure because that's like a hundred percent growth and very admirable and incredibly amazing at your age. So I don't want to, I don't want you to set up these goals too much for your for what is going to become a failure in your mind, but it's going to be a phenomenal success if it's actually stepped back and taken a look at from a much more objective standpoint. And so there's just no way without the capital that is going to be or, or massive amounts of debt that you're going to go from 200,000 last year to 2 million this coming this in 2023. I appreciate the 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 massive aspiration, but I don't want you to quit because in August you realize you're going to make 500,000 and you like, Oh man, I'm way short of my goal. Right. So, um, I would take a step back. I would do, I would do a projection for this year, every single month of what you're going to do in revenue. And then ask yourself in order to hit these revenue targets, what am I going to have to buy in terms of trucks, equipment, how many people am I going to have to hire? You're going to have to upgrade your shop massively. Even if you double in size in revenue this year, let alone 10 exit. Right. So, um, I would be much more objective about the size that you're going to grow this year and whether or not you do projects or mowing is inconsequential. Right now, what I'm trying to prevent you from doing is setting a goal so high that you do an amazing job as a teenager this year and yet you see yourself as a failure because you fall short of your $2 million goal. Um, and so I don't, I'm not saying you're not, in, uh, not capable of that. I'm just making sure that you set realistic expectations of the amount of capital that's going to be required and experience that is required to build a $2 million organization is, is, is pretty intense. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I completely get it. I'm, uh, I, I like shooting for big goals. And so sometimes I hit them, sometimes I don't. Mm-hmm. Um, and so honestly, if, if I don't hit it, it, it won't kill me. Um, but it's also something where I don't want to get halfway through the year and say I am for 500,000. I don't want to get halfway through the year, hit 500,000 and kind of sit back. So I try to aim for whatever's unreachable. So last year we were at uh, 10,000 and starting of last year and we wanted to hit a hundred thousand by the end of last year and we hit 250. Mm-hmm. And so we grew by, I don't know, what would that be? 2,500% or 2,500%, something like that. Mm-hmm. And so I've, that's just kind of the number that we set to aim for this year. And when I say we, that's just all yep. of us workers included. Okay, cool. So your, your question is, is should you split the divisions? Is that kind of what your question is for projects versus mowing? Yes. And so like if, if basically if we have a profitable mowing system mm-hmm. and we can do shrub trimming, things like that, should we cut out? Cause we're currently, we don't have the equipment. We rent the equipment for projects just because the maintenance on the equipment doesn't make sense to purchase it at this point. Mm-hmm. And so before we grow that massively, would it be a lot better just to focus down on mowing and get that so perfected that with all of our advertising and everything, we can hire someone? Because right now we have a week or two uh, turnaround time before someone's profitable. And so just to keep that system and just grow mowing and not even offer anything past something that we can do with hedge trimmers and like obviously spreading straw, edging bed, weeding, stuff like that we can offer. But should we cut out all of these retaining walls and sod jobs? And Like for instance, this weekend we had a $3,000 sod job and I was out laying sod till two in the morning because it's raining and we just don't have enough time to do it all. Yep. Yeah, so my recommendation would be like just step back and realize your age. And I, I'm not into age. Like, like obviously I started when I was really young too, but realize that the number one thing you don't have right now is experience. 
And so what you should be focused on is getting experience because that's your lack. And so in my opinion, building the organization in size, because if you have aspirations to grow a $10 million business, what you need is management experience. You need to learn how to grow with other people. And that's going to be much done much easier uh, by growing a, land, a, a mowing and simple service business where you have, have a bunch of employees and you got to train them versus trying to also then stack on top of that the fact that you lack the experience of excavation and grading and a lot of this equipment. You don't have the equipment. You're trying to rent it. So that's going to be a whole different ball game, a whole different business in my opinion compared to like what the skills you're going to be required to have to just manage the team, manage the people, do the marketing. So in my personal opinion, I would focus on what was wor is working well with your subscription model for mowing and simple services. And that means you can do push terms. I mean, you can do pooling weeds. You might even do some fertilization or mulch installs, but you're not going to do these paver patios and stuff that you got to rent massive equipment for. And then focus on getting the skills required for marketing, hiring, building a team, managing them. That's what's going to be useful down the road when maybe you add projects to go from a $2 million business to a $10 million business down the road. But I would focus on those skills that are going to be much more uh, uh, transferable as you begin to grow the company. Okay. So with that, with those leads that are still coming in for projects, should we just tell them that we don't offer that or should we refer someone else or what would you rec like, what would be the most professional way to handle someone that we've marketed to marketed sod laying to for the last year? And when they call for sod laying, what's the best way to kind of tell them that we don't offer that anymore? Yeah. It's rare that someone saw an ad eight months ago for sod laying is giving you a call because of that, because they didn't have the need back then. It literally was white space in their brain. So, as long as your current marketing cuts that out, as well as your website doesn't offer that as a service anymore, and you're very clear what service you do and do not offer, um, then you just weed out whatever gets through on the ads and or on, on the office side, like the phone call side, um, or even lead intake from your lead estimate request form. So um, just, just weed them out, realize that that's going to be more at the beginning because people have seen you working out doing these type of projects. But literally within six months, you will get way less of those type of leads coming in because you wouldn't have been doing the work. You wouldn't have been posting about them on social media. And so that those type of services will just diminish in the amount that you're getting in terms of leads. Should we find a company in town to sell those leads to or like should I would we find, find a project person I would to find recommend a them to or just tell yeah. them that we don't do it? I would find a hardscaping company that you so can refer them. That's kind of where I'm at. Is like, yeah. I would find a, a hardscaping company that you can refer them to and then just tell that hardscaping company like, hey, here's the agreement. I will give you all my hardscaping jobs if you can just give me all of your mowing customers because they're getting the same thing on there, which is they're getting all these mowing customers and people asking about their service. Just, hey, can you guys just hand those all over to me? I'll hand you all my leads. That's going to be the cleanest way to do it. Don't try to do subbing, and get five or 10 points on something. Uh, you're going to have all the headache and all the liability. And again, your focus is going to be scaling up your organization on the on the lawn care side. Okay. All right. All right, brother. Best of luck to you. Take care. All right. Next caller comes from 806. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Eight oh six. Hello, hey, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. How's it going? Hello. Hey, Mike. This, my name is Frank Garcia. How are you doing today? Fantastic. Hey, so um, I just wanted to um, kind of detail my business plan to go full time. I wanted to see your thoughts and opinions on that. Cool. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. So. Um, Last year, I pulled uh, 60K just working pretty much three days a week. And um, this year, I'm going into making just 100% profit. My equipment's paid for, my trailer's paid for, no um, debt on anything. Um, this is my passion. So I wanted to see, you know, spending this year to pay off personal debt. And then in a, my second year, fully into the business, going full time and leaving a ninety thousand dollar a year paying government job cool so you made sixty thousand from the business you made ninety thousand from your uh other job with the government and now you're thinking about going full-time yep. and do you think you're going to do that this yep. year um i think that i can pull more this year i've um, already got more customers lined out and I'm offering um, services of spraying and fertilizing that I'm licensed for. So I'm 
made it to where I'm only taking on new customers that also sign up for spraying and fertilizing, and that's had a 100% success rate right now. Mm-hmm. But we owe this year about twenty to 25000 in debt. So if I paid off all of that this year personally and then went full-time next year, do you see that as being a good, legitimate plan for life? What does your wife think about this? Um, she knows it's my passion. And for her, um, she sees me being at home more. And she just sees my overall happiness with this, with this work. And is she supportive of doing this when there's still debt? Uh, yes, even when there's still debt. I mean, she, she even helps me on the sides as far as like getting supplies for me from the local landscape shop, getting just, you know, anything for me that I need and coming to a job she'll do to help out in any way. Then I think, then I think you kind of answered your question yourself, right? Cause like you yourself want it. Um, you think that financially uh-huh. you can check the boxes to make it work. And then most importantly, you have the support system to be able to make this happen without a whole lot of bumps in the road or opposition. And that is your, in, in this case, your wife. So as long as you're both on the same page, I think you're good. You know, I think the more conservative route might be to say, let's take one more year, keep kind of grinding this out. Maybe I only make 70 or 75, but I'm still getting my paycheck so I can pay off this other debt. That'd be the, like the most conservative route. It's whether or not you can ex- can stand to stay with your current position uh, in your nine to five for one more year. Right. So that, that's a, a personal decision. I think that's uh, the decision that has to be made with your family. Cause they're the ones that are kind of at risk. If you try to jump in full time. Yeah. And I think it's right now something you enjoy uh, doing. And I'm not saying you're not going to enjoy it. And uh, right now there's a lot yeah. of flexibility cause you can do it on the weekends and all the rest of it. But just know when you jump in full time, there's now that financial pressure. What is going to be taken away from the family is the business. So being very clear yeah. with your wife and, and, and what your goals are, uh, just realize that it might be the opposite of what you feel now in terms of the business being flexible. It might actually flip because yeah. now you've got to replace $90,000 of, of W-2 income, and that means you're working a lot more. Yeah. And I, um, my background with that is, uh, is app development. Cool. So you know, I'd, I'd eventually like to maybe find some way to incorporate maybe an app or Cause I don't really want to lose that sense of my degree, but you know, maybe that's another business path or something on down the road, but what I just wanted to get it? your opinion what if you on flip that. It? Like what if right, like right now you're kind of doing your full-time programming and then you're doing part-time lawn care. Why not do lawn care? Um, and then on the side, try to make an extra 30, 40 grand doing stuff on the side with app development, right? Because that way you stay sharp with those yeah, skills. Yeah you still are able to kind of stay in that game, but then you're able to scratch the itch you have for the entrepreneurial side, but then also retain that flexibility in terms of being a freelancer uh, and a project-based, uh, from a project-based perspective for the app development. Gotcha. Yeah, actually, you know, I, I never really thought of it that way as doing side stuff or doing work on the side like that. It's just being a part-time employee doing stuff, you know, when I have the free time. Yep. It's kind of like school. It'll always be there. App development, you'll be fine forever. So like you can always go back to it. And if you just stay sharp with it on the side, then there'll be a sense of security too for you and your family knowing that there is a little bit of money coming in. You can cover at least the debt payments and your fixed expenses. No one's going to go hungry if something goes bad. And then furthermore, uh, you also can then, you know, go full time into the business still. Perfect. Yeah, and this year as well, I ventured into Christmas lights, which I used a different CRM for, so I don't really have the numbers off the top of my head, but that kept me busy from November to December and January. So, you know, that's kind of a revenue that I don't really have on top of my head. I wish I did, but um, I was literally at the gym watching your show, and I was like, hey, I'll try and call in. Maybe I'll get lucky. Cool. No, man, I think you, I think you kind of answered all the questions yourself. So um, best of luck to you this year. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your time. Yeah, Frank. Bye-bye. All right, next caller. I think this one's coming from Canada. I think it's from coming from Alberta. 403 number. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Yes. Hey, Mike. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Hello? Yep. Awesome. So I start, I'm kind of like you. I started mowing lawns when I was 10 with my dad and brother on uh, acreage here. I worked up to like seven lawns from like the age of 10 to 18 it wasn't a lot or anything but it was enough for like one or two a night and then from like 18 to 23 i tried out like college and stuff and then and like oil field and stuff and then at 23 i started um 
I dropped out of college when COVID hit. I started, um, I made a website. I got a business name, um, DS Long Care, I named it. Got like a business bank account. And then that summer I made six grand. And then that was 2020. And then 2021, I made 20 grand. And then last summer, 2022, I actually made 60 grand and I did snow in the winter. It was my first winter. I actually did snow all year. Mm -hmm. And during the summer of 2022, I actually hired a couple guys to do some landscaping jobs like sod. And actually they helped me mow too. And then also did some rock jobs too. So it was really cool. Like hiring people. I felt like I kind of made it. Mm -hmm. I actually ended up spending all my money. I was watching you every day. I ended up buying a ramp rack for like 7,700 bucks. It's not even on my truck completely yet. I ended up going like 18 K in, in credit card debt. So this summer I don't want to screw up, but I have over 200 contacts on my phone. And I'm like, I signed up for your web design lawn care website. And like, I put my name in for co-pilot. I'm thinking about doing P4P as well. I want to scale up to like well over a million. My parents kind of think I'm crazy. I'm 20, I'm almost 26. I still live at home, but I think I can do this. Um, I just, I don't know what, what's a realistic goal for 2023 as I made like 60K last year. Like we'll have to hire a guy to maybe get to 200 this year or maybe just try for 100. But, yeah, I, I don't know. I, my, I have a truck. I have, like, two push mowers, the weed lifters and everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm I hate – I don't like up. to be the, the dream basher on this show, but let's take a step back, all right? So okay. last year you did 60000 in total revenue. Is that correct? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Okay, 50, and, 60. and did you work full-time? Like, yeah, I was pretty full time. Okay. Some and days you, I wasn't like going all, well, it wasn't like, I don't know, 30 to 50 hours a week. Okay. Yes, that's full time. So, and then, but then you were hiring people as well. So like, I already know without asking your pricing that you're not charging enough because if you went full time, probably not. you have employees working for you. You have project base, which means you have cost of goods sold and supplies and materials, and you only did net a gross of sixty thousand dollars in revenue. I know you're not charging enough. Like, what are you charging per hour? Like, well, I was charging fifty dollars a cut last summer, and um, so we it would take like half an hour to do a lawn. So the lawns were good, but I didn't have enough lawn. To like I didn't have enough reoccurring customers. Like I maybe only had like 20 or 30, mm -hmm. but then I was making money off. Like I was doing some landscaping jobs, like putting in mulch and rock. And like mm -hmm. I did the one job last summer for six grand and it was 3000 in materials and employees. And I took home three grand in five days. So that's what kind of got me up to closer to 60. And then I had like three or four saw jobs. A couple of them are worth two grand, but reoccurring customers for weekly mows was like maybe 20 or 30. Okay. So I think I need to get that number up more and yeah, and not focus so much on the bigger jobs. Okay. So like if you, if you run the math on 25 customers and you, let's just say you mow them. Yeah. Okay. So we have 25 customers. Let's say you mow them at 50 bucks a pop, like you said, and let's assume that yeah. there's like 25 cuts in the year. That'd be $31,000. So that would assume that about half of your revenue came from mowing. The other half came from landscaping and projects, right? What are you charging yeah. per hour yeah. when you go to an estimate for projects? Like when you look at the job, okay, that's going to take me 10 hours. How are you coming yeah. with the number? Is, is I'm think, well, I, $100, I'm thinking. That's what I am thinking. Okay. So the problem with that, but go ahead. I think. I, I think I wasn't working as much as I think I was. Like, there's, I don't know. Like, I was doing hedge trimmings, too, and I was doing gutter cleanings. I made three grand just from gutter cleaning, mm -hmm. probably two, two or three grand from hedges. And then I was doing fertilizing and spraying as well. And yeah. I didn't use job or anything. It was just, I would text them. They'd be at work. I'd get their lawn, and I would text them, hey, do you want your lawn? fertilizer do you want some sprayer and they said yeah okay and then i said okay just e-transfer extra 50 bucks yeah so yeah. so here's the thing 
when you and, take when you take the thirty thousand out of of the mowing that you did, that means there was thirty thousand dollars worth of other project based work. Now let's assume that there is zero, yeah, zero uh, material cost, okay, and no employees, and yeah. all of that was straight labor revenue. That would mean that there are three hundred budgeted hours if you're charging hundred dollars per hour. Okay, so if you're charging hundred dollars yeah. per hour, that would mean that there's three. I didn't start till June. Okay. Okay, so you only worked half the year. Yeah, I had a DUI actually, and I couldn't get my license back till June. Got it. I did quit drinking though. Yeah, so I, I would just really focus on ensuring that you every single day you're tracking how many budgeted hours you're getting completed because I think you might be less efficient than you think you are, and you might be working 40 or 50 hours a week, but you might only be completing 18 to 20 budgeted hours worth of work a week. And so that's a number that would then imply a 50% waste, whether that be, you know, just inefficient routes, whether that be taking a lot of time at gas stations or going to the supply yard and taking a lot of time there. So I would be tracking every single day, how many budgeted hours worth of work you get done. Not how many clocked hours are completed, but how many budgeted hours. Next caller comes from five, seven, five. We got to keep it moving here on Saturday. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. What's up, Mike? Can you hear me? I can. How's it going? What's up, man? My name's Evan. Um, I'm over here in uh, Virginia Beach. I just had a couple questions for you. So uh, just a real quick uh, you know, synopsis of my story. I, I was in college, left, uh, started doing uh, lawns on the side, decided to get an LLC two years ago. I made 13 grand uh, net my first year. And this year I'm, I'm doing about 46 net. And um, I want to leave fully my my job i didn't um well i don't do it much anymore because i I used to deliver pizzas and then my car got totaled and then i bought a work truck and it's kind of old so i can't uh, do that anymore but this is months ago i want to fully commit to my lawn business but i'm kind of torn in which direction i should go and i was just gonna tell you um, a a bit about what i'm thinking and and, uh, get the two cents from that okay so just so i'm clear forty six thousand net what was your gross um, it was about, well, I haven't finished doing my, uh, taxes, but I, I'm thinking about 55. Okay. Okay. So you're ba- Okay. Got it. Okay. This is, these are kind of, these are kind of estimates. Man. Sorry about that. Cool. You're fine. Go ahead. Um, yeah. So I do, uh, Edgemo blow pretty much. I'm trying to do 80 to hundred an hour for that. I'm doing solo off when I do that. And so I have about 35 customers, um, that are weekly. And so, uh, I guess it would be about fifty dollars per customer. Um, and so, uh, I, I, I have them on a schedule so that um, in Virginia it's it's like a lot of rain in the spring and summers, but then the winters get dry, and it's about three months of just dead period. Yeah. And so I've been doing bi-weekly through the fall, and then monthly through the winter. Um, I have a, a lot of people who suggest to me either do weekly year round or do bi-weekly through the winter. But if I'm being completely honest, there's a couple properties. When I say a couple, I'd say maybe five to 10 to where I'll show up every two weeks. And I mean, like I'm not making a difference at all. There's no sticks being picked up. There's no lines being okay. made in the grass. It literally looks exactly the same as when I'm leaving. And so I kind of feel almost like I'm doing a disservice to these people. Like that. Uh, some of them don't have a problem giving me the money with them. Some of them are like, you know, I think I could have not charged you for this and then and then you'd be better off. Does that make sense? Totally. Yep. So are you asking um, kind of how to so, reconcile it in your brain? Yeah, so sorry, I'm so sorry about that. My uh, I'm gonna give the point. So I'm I've been uh, guided I try and find local uh, entrepreneurs, local business owners and connect with them and just hear what they have to say, give give me advice, stuff like that. Um and so what I've heard is that some people are like, Hey man, you, you should hire five dudes and, and start doing uh, sod installs and start doing hardscaping. And some guys are like, no, man, stick to edging, mowing, and blowing and just do that and just provide you know mediocre quality to get your clients up by the numbers. And then some guys are like, no, have uh, personal-based packages for each customer where you take care of the whole property and you do, uh, you do uh, you know, aeration and you do mulching and you do trim, bush trim cutting and stuff like that. And so I can offer... And I already do offer bush trimming and mulch and pine straw install with the Edgemo Blow. 
but people will be like, hey, can you do a, uh, a garden box or a retaining wall or a small gravel patio? And I'm like, yeah, sure, I could do that. But I'm kind of not understanding, um, you know, if I, as soon as I get multiple dues, I feel like it's going to be a headache and I kind of want to remain a solo op. So I'm trying to maximize my profits whilst not overworking myself because I'll be by myself. Okay. So I think the biggest problem that you have is you're listening to too many people. <laughs> Um, you're, you're not focusing on what you want from the business and rather you're trying to figure out what you want based upon what other people's results are. So you're listening to one guy cause he built a big, big mowing business and he's telling you, you should grow mowing. You're listening to some other person on YouTube or whatever saying you should do hardscaping cause that's what they did. You've got to figure out what you want from the business and why you want that. And so, um, I don't think you should be listening to so many people. Um, there's too many influences mm -hmm. in your head right now. So like when I run the math on $55,000 worth of revenue and I divide that out by $50 per cut and I divide that out by how many cuts per year, which you're probably doing about 30 per year, how many mowing customers do you have right now? Uh, routine. So that's the thing. Some of them don't want the fall and winter cleanup packages. So the routine spring and, and summer is, upwards of almost 40 so a little over 35 people um and a good a good portion of them are like yeah we don't need anything in the fall and winter essentially um so yeah it would be more like 26 okay yeah so so my numbers based upon that math that i just kind of quickly ran was like 36 37 uh customers that you would have as a, on a recurring basis now is your question how do you make sure that those people stay like are you having a, a struggle with charging people and mowing their grass when you don't feel like they need it? Okay. Yeah. So that was, um, that wasn't really the focal point of it. It was more so, uh, my area calls for, um, you know, or not messing up my area. Some people I talk to, the majority of people that want the grass mowing, um, in these, in this community is medium sized yards. They're not too big, not many like acres or anything like that. They kind of just want you to come in and cut it and leave. You know, I, I'm aiming toward the clientele of higher end people, but it almost seems like those are the people that want the aeration and the sod and the, and the thing. But what I want for my business is consistency. I like showing up and knowing, Hey, it's going to be X, Y, and Z today. And there might be a problem or two, but you'll, you know, it's not going to be like a, a new giant job that I'm unfamiliar with. And there's going to be a giant pickup. I like the repetitiveness. I like, you know, long care because it's relaxing and stuff like that. Um, so that's the direction I'm trying to continue for. Okay, cool. What, is there a specific question I can answer about that? Because it sounds like you kind of made your mind that's what you're um, going to do. Yeah, I was going to. I was going to suggest to you: should I? Uh, again, I'm trying to. Uh, um, should I go towards the path? In your opinion, since I want to remain a solo operator, get as many lawns as I possibly can and charge just kind of a mediocre rate, or should I lean more towards getting individual customers and charging more per stop? I would focus on filling your route because right now you're not at capacity with 25 million customers because you could probably get to 50 or 60 pretty easily as a solo op and still, um, you know, be able to handle all of them. So I would focus on doing that and then raising your prices to those customers. And then if you lose some customers, when you raise prices, totally fine. You're then going to refill them with new leads coming in. And so I would just really focus on filling to capacity your current schedule, whether it be mowing or whatever. I don't really care, but let's focus on mowing because that's what you want get 50 to 60 mowing customers, fill the capacity, then raise your prices and be able to get more profit from each customer. Next caller is from 431. I think this is coming from Canada as well. Welcome to the show. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, my name is Bjorn. I'm out of Winnipeg. Um, just to kind of give you a back, a back uh, story here. Last year, um, we went from 10K in February and all of a sudden to 20K and, and I had a real business running more than one truck. Uh, a couple of employees, and we were doing great. We took some of that money, forked it into websites, uh, marketing, all that great stuff, and suddenly, you know, within a couple of months, we're doing 30K a month. Again, coming into winter, we quadrupled our snow business, 4X, um, acquired some machinery to do that, so we got a little bit of debt. But essentially, we went from, you know, 200 to... 350 and we're on track to probably do 550 this year you. so my main question is now <clears throat> we're uh just closing out the winter it's been pretty weak here actually we were expecting a lot more snow so we're sitting on a bit more money than we expected um 
but not a ton because we did grow a lot. My question is, is what's, what's the best position to put myself in so that I'm not running around like a chicken with my head cut off in spring rush and lose a ton of leads from our uh, Google ads last year because I was being pulled in so many different directions, having a whole new crew, having to be in the field, having to answer emails and just, um, just all over the place. I, you know, do I, do I move to a shop? So I feel more organized There's an opportunity to basically upgrade for an extra 1600 bucks. I'll have an office space. We'll have decent shop space instead of running out of, um, storage containers and out of our garage. Um, so we'll have more space and organization or do I hold off on that and invest in an office person? Uh, just kind of see what direction you'd recommend so that this spring can be success. Are you are you eventually going eventually going to want to grow the business to like a million dollars? Is like that eventually the goal? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. So yeah. all the things you're mentioning, you're eventually going to have to do. You're eventually going to have to move to a shop. You're eventually going to have to get an office person. The question is the sequence of events and when she should do this, right? And so my exactly. my personal recommendation, based upon you feeling like you're a chicken without a head running around during spring rush, is take a year and stop growing. All right. And so what I mean by that is raise your prices cut out services that are causing you to be running around that cause 80% of your headaches. You know what services those are, cut those out and then realize that this year you might not grow double. You might only grow 50 or hundred grand in top line revenue, but it'll be much more profitable and much more sustainable because you'll be cutting out services that are causing all of your headache. And if you do that for one year, then next year you'll have the profitability and the systems in place to be able to actually scale to a million without it being chaos. I see. I see. Because you're going to have to eventually move to shop. So, eventually, going to have to hire an office person. But if you do those things too quickly, you're going to burn yourself out. And if you double the size of your business right now, you're going to double the amount that's on your plate because you're doing a lot of these estimates. You're running around, so you've got to make sure you have a healthier profit margin and you aren't taking mm-hmm. the brunt of all that growth on your plate. I guess the thing for me is that I just want more time because I'm, I'm four years old. We have two young ones under two married and, and I just don't, I want to be home by the end of the day and I wish I had someone in the office. Mm-hmm. So I just want to, I almost want to just buy back my time, even if it means we don't grow. I'm not looking to grow double during um, this summer necessarily. I'm happy sitting at 35 to 45 K per okay. month. So then fine. what I would recommend but doing just, is get the office person, move to the shop, and raise prices at the same time. Because if you raise prices even 10 to 15%, um, you are going to be able to make enough margin on that to be able to afford the $1,600 for the shop and an office person, even if they're four or five hours a day, you're going to be able to afford both of those things. And then what I would recommend doing, four. go ahead. No, it's say four or five hours a day. I like the sounds of that. I didn't think that, uh, you know, would be able to find someone that that's acceptable to not have eight hours because that four or five hours is awesome. Well, because That's affordable. There's, there's like, for example, a single mom that has another job where they, where they won't allow for overtime, but she needs an extra few hours on her paycheck. She might be a killer. She might be getting $25, $30 in her other job, but she needs a little extra to make ends meet. She might be the best thing that ever happened yeah. to you because she can come in the afternoon and make sure everything's routed for the next day, send out invoices, go through the email, answer yeah. phone calls. So I'd, I'd look at that. And then again, $1,600 a month, maybe a couple thousand dollars a month for that office person, maybe 3000 if they're really good and like you need them a little bit more. Um, that's $4,000. That's a 10% increase in your gross revenue. And that could literally be happening with one email and raising your prices. You can ac- accommodate all of those expenses. Yeah, yeah that, that sounds great. Yeah, and, I'm, and I'm looking to really ramp up the, the snow removal business again. And I just want to have them trained to handle all the customer uh, service. So, that Absolutely. sounds uh, doable. Appreciate it, Mike. You got it, brother. Support Take care. Pilot. Let's go. Appreciate it, brother. Yeah. All right. Bye-bye. Yeah. All right. Next caller. We got some. Sorry, the, the queue is full. Um, I'll just kind of try to you know, these pretty quick. If I drop your call, I have nothing against you. It's just we got to keep moving along. Next caller from 704. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Hey, Mike. How's it going? Good, good. Uh, my name is uh, Justin. I'm actually... Uh, I was a full-time real estate investor. Me and my wife uh, own a real estate business. But we recently jumped into junk removal. I don't know if you know anything about it, but it's really just trying to reach out and see you because I'm having trouble 
I don't even know how to be. Yep. So what's your biggest struggle right now? So you're switching from real estate into the junk removal. Uh, the ma- a massive yeah, we're, exodus we're, of real estate agents right now because the market the way it is. Um, so what what's your biggest struggle? We're getting a lot of jobs through real estate since we've been in it for a while, but they're mostly full, full clean out. And, you know, everyone says, you know, go by the load, but it's kind of hard to figure out what a load is doing full clean out. So it's hard to give out estimates. So I'm kind of catching myself, you know, just not even being in jobs at times. Yep. And so is you, are you trying to diversify from full cleanouts and focusing more on like construction maybe? Um, I like doing the full cleanouts. I mean, but we also do demolition. But I'm just really trying to figure out how to home in on on pricing. And, you know, that way I can offer them a better service and know that we're both coming out. Because in the past, like, four jobs, we have been, after we paid out two people and, and paying dump fees and all that stuff, we've been just, you know, grossing about a hundred, two hundred dollars for a whole for a long ten hour day. Right. And so are you are you having struggle getting more of those? Like what what's the problem I can help with? Just trying to figure out how I would home in on on setting a better uh pricing chart or put as far as estimates and stuff. What percentage of your estimates are getting accepted? Like when you give a quote out, is it pretty much everyone accepting it? Like, or what percentage of, or do you think are accepting the quote? Well, on the full, on the full, uh, on the full cleanouts, we have gotten four, and we've only been running since uh, January the first, and we've gotten four accepted, and we gave out five offers. Got it. So you're running an eighty percent, you know, close ratio. Um, is it this bigger struggle of just getting the leads? Because my thing is at 80% close ratio, I would be raising your prices to be able to accommodate a better margin for yourself. However, there's only five estimates mm-hmm. that have come in. So like, do you think you can move that to where on a monthly basis you're making 20 leads? Like, it, is that possible? Yeah, I believe that's possible. I've been doing it on the weekends because I run a, oh, cool. I run a uh, heavy equipment too. So I've been doing it on just the weekends. That's kind of why I've been scheduled back, but I kind of want to, I think I should just charge more, but I'm not sure about how they do the estimates and stuff on this quite well. That's fine. So doing something five times, you're not going to be great at anyways. Regardless of what industry you're in, you're not going to have the experience to be able to appropriate budget hours accurately. So what I would do is focus on getting more leads, focus on getting the reps of doing more quotes, and then just track your close ratio. That is the determining factor of how, if you're too expensive. So if you start getting only 30% of people accepting your quotes, you should probably that's an indicator that you're probably a little bit higher on, on the higher end of pricing. Don't worry about your what your uh, uh, competitors are doing. Don't go. It does not matter. All right. Your close ratio determines whether or not you're too expensive. And so if you're 80% now, and then you, but you do another 20 or 30 bids and you're still closing 80%, that means it tells me that you can absolutely raise your prices and make more margin. When you start getting a 50, 60% of your quotes being accepted, that's probably where you might want to stick around in terms of maximization of your profit and still growing a little bit. Um, but I would definitely just focus on getting more leads. Like if you had, if you had a hundred leads come in next month, I promise you'd be able to pay, you'd be able to increase your prices because you'd have so much work coming and you would not be able to ex- get them all accepted. You'd have to raise prices. So focus on lead generation because if you get more leads, you'll feel more confident to raise your prices and not care about letting, you know, 30, 40, 50% of people say no, because you can't actually take on that much work. Okay, so basically just focus more on getting more leads and worry less about getting correctly. And- no. Because okay. you, you'll get better and better as you get more of those reps and you get more quotes in. You'll get better and more accurate on budget hours and what your quotes are. Next question comes from 708. Welcome to the show. I think this is William. Hey, what's up, Mike? What's it up, is. brother? How's it going, brother? What's up? Hey, two questions for you, uh, and I hopefully we'll make it pretty quick, but uh, for the profit sharing, so let's say, for example, there was a thousand dollars at the end of the quarter for the profit sharing, yep. and you had five guys that worked the entire quarter. Mm-hmm. If four guys didn't have that good attendance, do you give that one individual only two hundred dollars, or do you give him the full thousand dollars? Nope. So basically, whoever is eligible. So let's say you have ten employees, and only five of them were stayed the whole quarter. That means that that thousand dollars gets divided by. Uh, 
by five. So $200 a pop, like you said, if four of those people then are not eligible because they were late, they had call outs, whatever, then you are, that person's getting $200. We used to actually divide by the total number of employees that were there to account for the fact that there's churn, but we decide, Hey, we're actually going to make it just the people who have been here the entire quarter and are eligible. And they typically know that like, if they're eligible, they definitely make want to make sure that they are not uh, you know, losing out in profit sharing. So we still do it by the number of people that are eligible. We divide it out by that. And then it's based upon who's actually, um, who gets the, when I say eligible there, I mean, who's been there the whole quarter. And then it's based upon lates and tardies, stuff like that. Gotcha. And then a uh, caveat to that uh, additional question. So um, to my understanding, you guys like have like the time frame that if they do need the day off, that they have to let you know by maybe like five o'clock the night prior. But like, do you allow like unlimited times for that, or do you? How do you like regulate that if somebody like calls off or like needs a day off, and as long as they tell you by that certain time that they're not doing it like two days a week consistently, you know? Um. Yeah. Like, there's one thing. So, from a profit sharing perspective, like you said, they have to give us a certain amount of heads up the day before. Um. If they don't, then they're it's going to go against their profit sharing. The other side of the coin is if they're calling out two or three days in advance, but every single week. Yeah, it might not help be held against their profit sharing. They just might not have a job because we can't do that with our scheduling. Eventually, we have to let them go and be honest like, hey, like this is not going to work out. So even though they're not getting penalized on profit sharing, they might not have a job if they're doing it so consistently, even if they're giving two or three days heads up. So it's eventually they're just not going to work out. Gotcha. Okay. And then uh, my second question was for the, so I really like the idea of, of the door hangers and like we do that with the estimates and stuff. But it was um, like, how do you handle when you're doing that in HOA communities that they like require a solicitor's badge to like, and then you have to pay a fee for like each individual employee. Cause like back in the day, my mom helped me kind of hand out fires and she actually got like a $400 ticket because the like police came and like shut her down because she was like helping us build her company and going door to door and stuff like that. How do you handle that? Yeah, so if you're in a market where it's like gated communities, HOAs, and they're going to have you know no soliciting, for example, the way around this is just every door direct mail because everyone has, still has a, a mailbox. Uh, and honestly, when you take the cost of labor of distribution for door hangers and you run that against every door direct mail and the cost per, per delivery, it's relatively close. So in markets where you have lots of HOAs, no soliciting allowed, that's probably the, you're going to be your go-to. Next question comes from 828. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Hey, how you doing today? Good, good. I'm, I'm actually called for another caller. Uh, if he's in the chat. His name's KC. He, he don't like talking on in, in public. I don't either myself, but I'm going to try to help him out. He's trying to start a, he's starting like a new, uh, like a landscaping business. And he, he's having trouble getting leads. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I kind of give him what, what I've learned from you. Uh, what would you, what would you, he said he lives in, in a, a populated area, you know, uh, after coming, you know, like developments in his area coming up. What, what, uh, what advice would you give him as far as like he's, he's struggling getting leads? He's just now starting like a like, like a mowing landscaping. Mm -hmm. Absolutely cool. Yeah, I'll go ahead. I'll, well, I'm kind of looking through the uh, the chat too and taking a look at what he's been saying. So yeah, sounds like uh, Cody. Uh, he has 30 customers from 600 door hangers in my first year. If you want to grow quick, your pricing need to be low, but not too low. Don't go below. Okay. So you have 30 customers. You got that from 600. Uh, I think that's who you're talking about Cody. Yeah. Okay. So can bring leads in from and execute all of the throughout the spring. You have no choice but to grow. Yeah. So like, I think, you know, if you can get, if you can get 30 customers from 600 door hangers, you got yourself a strategy, right? So keep doing the door hanger thing. If you can get, like that's an incredible amount of customers to it's like what 5% close ratio on the amount of people you deliver door hangers to. So I just keep doing that. Um, and then also realize that as you grow, your time becomes more valuable. So instead of doing door hangers and spending time, take some of the money you're making and go get yourself a website, go spend some ads on marketing so that you can switch instead of paying, paying in terms of time, you're paying for your ads and your leads in the form of money, which is going to be pay per click, a website, things like that. Next caller comes from 615. Welcome to the show. Hey, Mike. How you doing? Good. How you doing? Pretty good. So um, I started uh, my business last fall. It's still in its infancy. Um, I got licensed and insured, did some leaf removals, and um, 
try to get my name to these customers for the spring rush. But my question is, how do you approach the transition from a full-time job making 50K a year with good insurance to a full-time lawn care business? Like, how do you know when it's time? Totally. So, like, right now, you're trying to transition away from your 9 to 5 then? Yeah. So I would, what I'd personally do is take them out the revenue that you are making in the business, uh, you know, extrapolate with your profit margins on that, and then figure out what you are going to have to make in the business in order to be able to replace your current W two income. So are you making like, like if you don't mind me asking, what do you make at your current job in terms of revenue, uh, in terms of your income? Uh, it's fifty k before um, taxes. Cool. So probably but- maybe. 40. 35 maybe? Yeah, so let's just call it 50, 40. right? This is the sake of example. Let's call it 50. So then it's okay. Well, if I can make 75 or 80,000 in gross revenue in my lawn care business, that's probably going to equate to about $50,000 in profit. So the question is, can you get it to 40 or 30 part time on the weekends, kind of hustling? And then know that based upon your experience doing it for one season on the side, that when you switch over to being full time, you're immediately going to get above 80, 90,000, which will replace your personal income. And so especially if you have like a family and things and like you're like, hey, I'm pretty you know, cautious about leaving my job, the dependable paycheck is get a year where you're doing 20, 30, 35,000 on the weekends, on the side, in the evenings, and then make the jump in one spring rush, probably next spring rush to being able to go full time and knowing that you'll then carry 70, 80, 90,000 in annual revenue and be able to replace the income that you had from the job. Okay, Mike. Well, I appreciate it. Absolutely, brother. You take care. All right. I misspoke on the last question. Looks like KC here. He's in a very populated area. A lot of retirees here just need to tap into the market. So I apologize, Cody. I am on next door. Doesn't seem to be much use in my area. I had posted earlier. I'm a new startup. I'm just struggling to start leads in right now. I have all commercial equipment needed. Zero payments. No debt besides my house. Making this full time. I don't, I do not, don't have the personality to call in. Definitely need the help though. Okay. I got you. Thank you. Whoever called in earlier for him. I appreciate that. If you're only bringing in 60, right? There's no way you can bring anyone on. Okay. Let's see here. Going back. I'm trying to go back in the scroll, finding Casey, 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 Casey. There you go. Aerials. Is there anything doing signs at intersections? Okay. I'm sorry. I'm just trying. I have a bunch of business cards and my truck magnets will be here in this week. I will look at getting door hangers and signs made up. I just started my business here, struggling to find customers. Don't really have budget for marketing. Been using Facebook, but everyone already established keeps knocking me out of the running. Okay, so I think honestly, just based upon the amount that you're commenting and things, you are looking for no's instead of yeses. I'm not being hard on you. I'm just saying this is the reality of the situation. Is instead of looking for every single way that your business could uh, is being shut down or why the market is bad, dense population, this doesn't work, that doesn't work. Be okay with the fact that you're that's how business is. Like if it's if it was easy and like all of these things work, and I can just give you a magic pill that we all be millionaires and we all be able to figure out what marketing worked in our specific demographic, uh, then it, it'd be it'd be easy. Um and, and everyone would do it and that would crush our our returns. It would crush our profit margins. And so what I would recommend doing is opening yourself up from a mentality standpoint to the fact that you're going to have to try multiple things. You're gonna you're gonna have to push yourself hard and that you're gonna have a lot of no's before you have yeses, which means you might try some every door direct mail, you might do some door hangers, you might do some cold calling, you might go talk to some property managers, you might post on Facebook and it not work. Like all these things might happen and they might not work out. Um, two things. One you might eventually swing and actually hit something and get lucky and you hit the one thing that would start to work really well and you keep pounding that or two, you just got to keep grinding and hustling and realizing that when you have 50 people say no on door hangers or door knocking, that number 51, 52, and 53 all say yes and now all of a sudden you've done 53 houses and you have three new jobs on the schedule and you have a a 6% uh, rate of people accepting quotes of knocking on, on doors and just a numbers game. So, just don't don't allow the 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 four or five or fifty no's to prevent you from the next three yeses. And so most people will just give up way too soon 
and they they say, oh yeah, every door direct mail doesn't work, or print marketing doesn't work, websites don't work, only word of mouth, only Facebook. Like they get so locked in on that, like nothing is working. It's like, look, be open to the fact that um, it might not be working in the short term, but you making a few tweaks, be improving your sales ability, improving the way that you do your door hanger, improving your salesmanship, improving the way that you um, a, a, a peer professional when you knock on someone's door. Those are things that you can work on. And uh, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. Next call comes from 954. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Hello. Mm -hmm. What's up? Oh, how you doing, Mike? Good, good. I, I have 40 I have 40 customers. I'm on um, last year I started in May. I'm thinking of doing um every door direct mailing. Yep. And I have like 5,000 mailers, but in my service area it's like in my five miles, I have just about half a million people. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of sending my first round to um, an area where I only have like two customers in. But this area, they they offer like, they, they, they accept full service as far as my other area, they only want mowing. But this area, they want mowing, um, bush trimming. Basically, I can give them other services. So I'm trying to figure out which area should I hit first with the every door direct mail. Do you think your brand and the business as you've built it currently is going to appeal to the type of customer that's higher end and wants full service? Um, I'm not sure yet. That's my question, really. Yeah, because that's what everyone wants that customer. The question is, does that customer want you? Right. The reason you might be getting customers from the places that just want mowing is because your brand has been associated with that type of service. And so if you're wanting to get into those other right. markets, instead of trying to force yourself in by spending a bunch of marketing that might not have never worked because your brand and your business is not built for that type of customer in terms of the branding, the professionalism, multiple trucks, having the dependability, automation, right. the CRM. If it's not built for that, you might you might literally be spending money into oblivion, even though those are the better customers. Right, 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 right. Even I, I have like one or two customers over in that area. So I'm like, oh, let me see if I can try to get more over here or the other area. I have maybe five or six over there, but they're all the, I'm only just mowing there. So your, your so sample size is too small, right? So if you have two in one area and five or six in another, I would recommend splitting the first little bit of your every door direct mail. Like I would do, instead of doing 5,000 in one or the other, I would do like a thousand in one area and a thousand in another, and then figure out from there, which one pops off the best and then spend the other 3000 mailers on the better, the better performing area of those two, because you do not know based upon just five or six customers, which area is going to receive your uh, marketing and your brand the best. Next caller comes from seven one nine. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Hi, I'm John and I have this business and I just ordered the door hangers. I was just wondering like, if you get shut down by a customer at a, in a neighborhood, could you go back to them and, like, keep advertising to them or just... What do you know? mean by shut down? Like, did they get mad at you because you came to their door? Or, like, they just be like, nope, sorry, I don't need your service. Uh, and were you doing door knocking? Yeah. Yeah, I, I would just not come back. Don't, don't try to sell the unsellable, right? Go to the next door, spend your time on the person that potentially might take your service. Don't worry about the person that said no. Be professional. And then down the road, if they need your service, they'll remember that you were professional. They like talking to you and you were, uh, you know, amicable to talk to when you, even though they declined you. So just stay professional and focus on the next time you see them. Otherwise, focus on the next customer that might potentially say yes. Next caller from 573. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Five seven three. Unmute. <laughs> oh no, they were in the waiting room for so long. Five seven three, can you hear me? I think it's from Missouri. Oh no, we're gonna end. We're gonna end on a no no call no show. <laughs> oh man. All right. Sorry about that. Five seven three. I'm gonna go ahead and drop you out of the queue. All right, everyone. I'm gonna go ahead and call it there. Hope you have a fantastic Saturday. 93 minutes. 93 minutes. Potentially one of our last 
live streams before the spring rush. We've got a lot going on here at Augusta Lawn Care as well as Copilot CRM is going to be launching. I just want to say thank you all uh, for your support. Um, LawnCareMedia.com has been crazy the past little bit and people have been buying a lot from there. So I really wanted to say thank you. Same thing with Lawn Care Web Design. Uh, it's allowed us to, to get more media team members. We now have five people in the media team producing content for industry every single day. Um, and so obviously some of their time is diverted towards Augusta, but the, the vast majority of it is to create content for the community. So I just want to say thank you all so very much. Um, we have some really cool stuff. We want, we're going to be bringing new to lawn care media. Um, and I think it's be very helpful, especially for people that are just getting started. So definitely check that out. Lawn care web design. If you're above 200,000, I'd recommend that. So what I'm trying to do is kind of create lawn care media for people that are very small under a hundred thousand in annual revenue just trying to get customers with, with door hangers, postcards, et cetera. And we have some really cool stuff we're going to do for them in terms of like trying to create their CRM on paper. I know it's horrible. Like that's horrible. That's it's better than in your head. It's better than inside of your phone. And I mean like documenting a phone call and documenting a lead intake form and things like that. So we're going to be working on some stuff uh, when it comes to lawn care media, but I just want to say thank you. I really do appreciate it. We run our profit and loss and the media team knows this so that you can talk to them and ask them if, if this is true because they see the numbers. Uh, we run the, the profit and loss where like every dollar we make, we're able to uh, get more team members and just produce more content and videos. So lawncaremedia.com, lawncarewebdesign.com, homeservicewebdesign.com, uh, all the support. I really do appreciate it. And uh, you know, we have, we have Copilot coming out next week. We're starting to roll it out to all the users. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty stressed out. Uh, lots of work going into it. Um, and just to start, honestly, in my mind, of like a pretty long journey of what we're trying to build. So I'm pretty excited about it, but it's been a lot of work and I appreciate all of your support. Um, make sure that you check out like the Facebook page and the YouTube channel for Copilot. There'd be updates on that. CopilotCRM.com, you can sign up pre-register and uh, it's going to be crazy. The next few weeks are going to be absolutely nuts. So that's why I'm, I'm kind of going longer today. I don't think I'll be doing a live stream for the next couple months just because of the spring rush with Augusta Lawn Care as well as Copilot being launched out. How, however, we are trying. We are trying. My, I'm trying my best. Hopefully, I don't even know if I should say this, but like hopefully in June, I'm going to go out and I'm going to start a brand new Augusta Lawn Care location uh, out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, you know, hours and hours away from where I live on the other side of the country, actually. And I'm going to document it over the course of 30 days, kind of vlog style, me starting up a business from scratch. So we'll see how that goes. Um, hopefully I can grow it up enough in a month to be able to then hand it off to a general manager. And then I can own that location remotely um, through Augusta Lawn Care and the command center can handle everything. So that should be really interesting. Um, but that'll probably be after the spring rush. It will be after the spring rush. Um, we really got to focus here at command center and on, um, Augusta lawn care for our spring rush. We have a lot of new locations. We just had 28 people here last weekend getting trained up and ready to roll. So, uh, we moved into a new office at command center for Augusta lawn care. We're going to have probably 50 plus people there, uh, answering phone calls, doing estimates, doing payroll for command center Augusta. So really, really locked and loaded on that. Uh, but yeah, for a lot of you, I've been looking forward to Copot. Really looking forward to launching that next week as well. And uh, yeah, it's going to be crazy, crazy. We're really focusing on stability of the product and really making sure that it is going to work well from day one. And uh, then the features that we want to roll out will probably start in March and April, start adding more features and more more enterprise level features for larger operations. And uh, it's going to be fun. Really looking forward to it. And uh, yeah, I appreciate all of you supporting what we're doing, supporting whether it be uh, just watching the channel, whether that be buying stuff on longcaremedia.com or longcarewebdesign, um, mikeandies.com. We just, we just made a new website, by the way. If you haven't checked it out, mikeandies.com, brand new website. We just redesigned that. There's a brand new free course for P4P. Just go to mikeandies.com slash P4P. Walks you through how to do pay for performance step-by-step -step inside of a course. It's completely free. Um, and we got some really cool stuff coming up. So really looking forward to it. And uh, I appreciate all of your support. Have a great weekend. And, uh, as we head into spring rush, stay strong, not going to be easy. Never is. If it was, everyone would be doing it. Um, and just discipline yourself in every aspect of the business. So that way, it, when times get tough, the, the disciplined rise, something we talk about with our franchisees. And that is, I, I personally see the person, the people that are most disciplined, the ones that succeed in every aspect of life and they're disciplined. It, it trickles over, right? The person that is disciplined in their physical health and being able to eat right and you know not over drink and not 
do have have habits that are really negative for them and their family. The person that's disciplined themselves that way, they typically will roll into discipline in their business, dip, discipline in their schedule, discipline the ability to be able to be a leader. And uh, I just recommend as we head into spring rush, focus on the low hanging fruit, the things that might be simple, like okay, I'm gonna go out and do a workout. I'm gonna get a gym membership. I'm gonna eat start eating healthy there. I'm not gonna drink myself into oblivion every weekend. I'm gonna stop doing drugs. I'm gonna make sure that I clean my life up a little bit here. Uh, I'm gonna focus on my relationships that we can um, have a healthier balance and a healthier lifestyle going into the spring rush. Those things matter when you hit spring rush because the threshold at which you're able to start taking on stress in the business becomes extreme, much, much higher when other aspects of the business have, have discipline, have systems in place. And we talk about systems all the time for your business, but if you can create systems in your personal life, your personal relationships and your health and your family, uh, trust me, it leads to a massive higher capacity that you can grow into in the business. So I wish you guys all the best um, and uh, go kill it. Take care. Have a great spring rush.